things that are closely related to this. Um, so it's it some of the ways in which these different sub these different schools developed it were from a computational numerical perspective. The question of efficiently numerically integrating the master equation. So it's one, one way that this whole subject developed. And in particular, this was, you know, back in the late 1980s, early 1990s, when computer memory, you know, was rare. And, um, and so, especially if you were looking at large dimensional Hilbert spaces, and we're, at that time it wasn't even about exponentially large for a, you know, a many body system with lots of qubits, no one was thinking about that at that time. It was really more just, you know, thinking about things like laser cooling of atoms where my, your Hilbert space was, uh, you know, something that was effectively an infinite dimensional Hilbert space for the free particle motion of atoms. Of course, it's not infinite dimensional, but it might be there. You have many, many momentous states and you have to take care of. And your density matrix would be really big. And, it, and the question of how you're going to do that when you have the big density matrix is one of, one of the ways. But it also, um, especially from, uh, you know, so I'll, I'll mention some of the names. I mean, Howard Carmichael, uh, really invented the, the word quantum trajectories. Uh, you know, there were sort of foundational questions. So one of the ways that developed was this was uh, Nicolas Chissin uh, was to, trying to develop a, a formula to explain how the wave function might dynamically collapse. If you think about the collapse of the wave function as a dynamical process rather than some magical thing that you just say you learn something and then you, that, that the, the Wave, the collapse of the wave function could be understood dynamically. It's intimately related, as we'll see, to the question of what's we call continuous measurement. Uh, and you know, the collapse of the wave function again is you we haven't really solved that problem in the conceptual aspects that we have about the question of you know the measurement problem. But nonetheless, there is an aspect of an actual, when an actual measurement is happening, how do we describe it, okay? Because there is a physical interaction between the system and the meter, and, and what does it mean for that? So that was one of one. And the Monte Carlo wave function really technique was about, really originally about numerics. And this was about the question of are there quantum jumps? We'll talk about all these things along the way. Uh, and some of the people that are involved here, uh, and I'll we'll be sharing the notes, um, Klaus Molmer and, uh, oh gosh, um, uh, Jean Dalibar. Is he the same guy at the Monmer sort of thing? Yes, and he was also Philip Loger's PhD advisor. Ah. Uh, and uh, Yvonne Castan, they developed this whole th idea of, of quantum Monte Carlo wave functions. Uh, and there are people like uh, Peter Knight here and um, other, lots of people whose names are not included. Um, and it's really incredible to me. I mean, the subject kind of developed at the time I was a graduate student. Uh, and now, you know, it's like, mom and apple pie. Uh, it was completely a totally new thing back then. 
Um, and it wasn't really appreciated until I think very recently. Okay, <laughs> so where, where to begin to get into this? To begin is I wanna think about this first of all, just from the conceptual point of view. And in particular, I wanna think about the whole story about, as we've been discussing, about the relationship between open quantum systems and measurement. The interrelationship about these things is, you know, what was motivating Alan Carmichael in particular. Um, and we have formalized this in one particular way, right? We've talked about the whole idea of a CP map. And the CP map, um, we have said also could be written in terms of a, a Krauss representation. operators that aren't necessarily unique, we'll come back to that point again a little bit later, maybe not today, but certainly on Thursday. Um, and the relationship between this and what we call the measurement model. So what we said is every CP map is a Krauss map, and every Krauss map can be understood as arising from a measurement model. And that measurement model um, is the situation in which we have, we think about the environment as a meter. So we think about the idea that there is a quantum system and it's constantly being monitored by the environment, okay? But we can think about the environment as having, when it's doing this, it's monitoring the system, it contains information about the system that is in principle accessible for us to find. And that, if we look at the, the uh, uh, environment, we can, find out something about the environment by with certain outcomes of the environment that have some index mu. And those outcomes are ways in which we would gain information about the system by looking at the meter, all right? So we think about the environment as a, as a big macroscopic thing that has a, uh, has some record that we could, in principle, look at, okay? And so some of the ingredients that we discussed, that we have been discussing related to this that I want to re-emphasize are, firstly, that there are, for each one of these outcomes, there is a Krauss operator. The Krauss operator can be thought of as coming from the CP map in, by tracing out the environment where we have some fiducial state of the environment that has interacted in some unitary way, typically entangling the system and the environment. So this is the definition of the CP map from the point of view of the measurement model. There is an ancilla, or the environment is the ancilla, which is prepared in some fiducial state. They entangle, we, we trace it out. That gives us a Krauss map, where the Krauss operators are, is the partial matrix element of the system environment entangling interaction between those two, right? So that's one ingredient. The second ingredient is the idea that such a measure model gives rise of a way 
of us thinking about how we would implement a PLVM that does some measurement on the system that is specified by a set of operators that are positive. And if this is a trace preserving map, then this is also a resolution of the identity. So we have a POVM. And the POVM that we're doing on the system can always be imagined to be implemented through this ancillary process, right? Through this cascaded process. And so what are the POVM elements in this case? They're at, they're made of the craft operators. And what, what, how are they related to the craft operators? And you make that around, right? So these sum to the identity, sum to the resolution of the identity. And moreover, we have the Born rule. And the Born rule tells us that the probability that we're going to see that particular outcome is the expected value of the POVM element. Okay? So that's what the POVM, if we just had the POVM and we didn't have the measurement model, we would just know how to calculate the probabilities. We need the measurement model to know then what is the post measurement state. And the post measurement state uh, tells us that the, is quantum Bayes' rule. Tells us that condition on having found outcome mu, the state af of the system after that is what we get by acting conjugating the state by that, and then renormalizing, which is the same thing as dividing by P mu. And I've called this, as I like to do, quantum Bayes rule. If rho is a pure state, then we often write this as the pure state after the measurement is the action of the Krauss operator divided by the norm, which is the square root of P. Okay? So the measure this is a measurement model, but importantly, what we also know is that the map is equivalent to throwing away the measurement record or never obtaining it in the first place. And we don't, if we don't have access to the measurement record, then all we can do is say, well, I should take the average, this convex combination, or the statistical mixture of these possible states that would have arisen had I obtained mu, but since I don't got mu, I got to average over that. And that's just, again, given by this definition, is the same thing as the Krauss map. But it's a, it's a useful conceptual picture and also, as we'll see, numerical method to think about the map as, OK, maybe I actually am going to do these measurements and then average over them somehow. And if I do that, then I will have done the same thing as the open quantum system dynamic, okay? So that leads us to thinking about 
Um, uh, Monte Carlo method of simulating a CP map. Now, what I'm about to show you is completely brain dead. You would never do this. There's absolutely zero reason for doing this. It just you made things much more complicated and way more, way more uh, convoluted in a way that is totally useless, practically, but it's gonna be conceptually important, okay? So let's just, for ease, let's just say I have two POV amounts. Uh, uh, E0, which is M0, or M0 and E1. Okay, so I have two Krauss operators and two POV elements. Okay? And they sum to the identity. They're both positive operators, they sum to the identity, they are therefore POVM. Okay? And um, I want to simulate the action of the map that's described by these two, two Krauss operators, right? So that means rho out is M dagger. Okay, so just for, I'm gonna, for simplicity, let's, let's suppose uh, that my input state is a pure state. Okay. Then my output state, I could say is a statistical mixture of two states, right? Where P0 is this, and P1 is that, and psi zero is the action of this renormalized, and similarly for one, right? I, it's a tautology, it's just the facts. Now, suppose I wanted to simulate this map. One way I could do it, which again is ridiculous, but I could, is to do it through a Monte Carlo method. Okay? What do I mean by that? So what I'm gonna what I need to do is have a coin, a bias coin, that either gives me outcome zero or outcome one with this these different probabilities. Okay? So one way, and once I do that, I can then take the statistical mixture of many, many runs of the experiment. So I can really write this as the sum, as the limit, as n goes to infinity, the statistical mixture of pure states where in each one of these uh, um, states in the statistical mixture, I have applied either M0 or M1 with the right problem, with the right fraction, right? So let me try to be clear what I'm trying to say here. So let's say I, um, I calculate P1, okay, which I can as this, okay. And now what I'm going to do, I have, so P1, so here's zero, here's one, P1 is, is this thing, 
this fraction of, of this bar, this histogram. And now I'm going to have a, a number r, which is a random number uniformly distributed between 0 and 1. And I'm going to throw a dart at it, and it's going to land somewhere. Right? So if this is, if r is less than p1, then I'm going to say that psi is equal to m1 times, or I'll call this psi, psi prime, divided by m1. Let me call this psi super i. So it's after, this is in the ith run of this experiment, I do this. If r is greater than p1, which means r, that means r is in this region, then I apply this guy. So in any run of my numerics, I either get this or this, okay? I then reprepare the state in the same initial state and do it again. I, I run a MATLAB, take this R, I throw a dart, right? And I see where it lands. And I'm either going to throw, I'm either going to get it either bigger than that or less than that. I'm going to either apply this or that. And I do it again, and I do it again, and I do it again. And if I do that again, then the fraction of the times that I get uh, you know, uh, this grade, I'll get P0 and the other fraction will get P1. Yeah, I do. Does each run, um, does each run um, evolve independently in time of the other runs in the... Yeah, so in this case, there's no time. Okay. I, I'm not talking yet about the business of a quantum trajectory. I'm just saying I want to do this math. Okay? There's no notion of time evolution at this point, other than, of course, it did come from you know, a measurement model. I could have thought about there as some, some time. But at this, at this stage, it's really, there's no dynamics. I'm just saying there's a map. And, and when I'm, yeah, go on. Well, then, as a, as a secondary but unrelated question, how might this um, dart throwing method uh, generalized to more than two jump off? Right, Not, no big deal. What I would do is I would divide them up into, you know, I'd have P1, say, say I have P0, P1, and P2, which might be like this. And I divide this up and say, if it's in this region, I throw a dart. If it's in that region, then I apply P2. If it's in this region, I apply P1. So I would calculate all the probabilities or at least I can calculate n minus one of them, the rest of them adds up, and then just throw a dart and see where it lands, okay? But the key point here is the idea that I, I do this over and over again. I have to re-prepare the initial state, and then, uh, you know, calculate, do the quantum Monte Carlo, apply the right Krauss operator to it, and then get the state, the post-measurement state, store that in my memory, and then add that up many, 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 many times to the point that I feel like my, the law, law of large numbers tells me that the frequency with which I get the right thing converges to the probability. Yes? So is that any, um, like, do we have a model on how, how this scales vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, you know, the, like the, the most direct method that I can imagine. Oh, this scales terribly in this case. I mean, firstly, the most direct method, I mean, I, I have the Krauss operators, I just do it, right? I mean, why the hell would I do this? This is not, it's, it's, that's, this, again, this is, the point of this is in no way, it's just to show how you would do this in any way in America, but just, it's really a conceptual point that's gonna lead into what we're gonna talk about in a moment, where there is some potential numerical advantage to doing that. Not the biggest anymore, but we'll, we'll talk about it. Yeah.
But everyone understands this conceptually and understands how this equals this, and how you would do it in principle, right, on, on, on a computer, which you will. You won't do that exact problem, but you'll do something close to it. Okay? All right, so now what I want to say is what we have been talking about over the last few weeks is how the open quantum system dynamics under the Markov approximation is just a CP map. So the Lindblad master equation is a differential CP map, right? So again, to remind us, the master equation, we've written it many different ways. I'll write it many different ways again, just to emphasize over and over again the form of it, because it's something that you should have memorized. effective here is the non-hermitian Hamiltonian or effective Hamiltonian which has an imaginary part in it or an anti-hermitian part and this prime here just means that we have to take the dagger on these guys, right? And the set of L mu's are what we call the Lindblad jump operators. Right? And what we uh, can say is that, you know, if I look at rho, then a t plus delta t, right, which is rho of t plus d rho in a time interval dt, then I can think about this as a CP map acting on the state at time t. Okay? And in particular, the CP map has a set of Klaus operators, I'll say mu greater than zero, m mu are l mu square root of bt, and m zero is equal to one minus i over h bar h effective bt, which is, because this is bt, is evolution according to the non-Hermitian Hamiltonian kind of continuous evolution, and we call these jump evolutions. So given a CP map and given a um, measurement model, which is equivalent thus to a set of Krauss operators, we can think about simulating the time evolution for, for this that takes me from time t to time t plus delta t using Monte Carlo. Okay? Um, so, in a given time step, delta t, we have different measurement outcomes. Let's 
for simplicity, let's, as we did over there, let's consider the case. We'll come back to them later. Of one jump operator. So then we have two cross operators. We have M1, which I'll say is that, and we have M0, which is 1 minus i over h bar h minus a half or dt. So we have these two Krauss operators that tell me everything I need to know about the map over that time interval, okay? So firstly, again, I can ask which of these measurement outcomes, if I had access to the environment, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and I could determine whether this outcome happened or that outcome, and we have to think about what that means, then I know how to update the state because I have quantum Bayes rule, okay? So firstly, I can ask, okay, so psi at t plus delta t goes to psi 1 of t plus delta t, which is m1 psi at t divided by the norm of that. And in this case, that's applying the jump operator divided by the norm of that with probability dp1 which is equal to the expected value of m dagger m. Right? So with 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 this probability, if we we're, we're, if we actually observe what's in the environment, we do the measurement that corresponds to the particular outcome, then the state, if we found outcome one, we should apply the jump off, we apply the Krauss operator, we normalize, that's equivalent to applying the jump operator and we normalizing. And we do that with this probability, which in this case is equal to the expected value of L dagger L dt, plugging in this, okay? Otherwise, it goes to psi zero, which is equal to e to the minus psi. We apply the no jump. So we either have a jump or no jump. In this particular differential time interval. And that happens with probability dp0, which is, of course, 1 minus dp1, which is equivalent to the norm of the decaying wave function. Right? That is equal to the expected value of m0 dagger M0. Is everyone with me? Does everyone, anyone have? So let's absorb this for a moment. What this says is in the same way that I did that brain dead two outcome POVM, I could imagine this doing this time interval in exactly the same way. I could say, okay, in this, I started with a pure state. Okay, so I really should say this. I started with the state psi of t. And I want to get the state at 
say a time t plus delta t. It's going to be one of these guys. It's either going to be this or that if I obtain full information from the environment in this particular measurement model. Okay? And if I that measurement model is related to these quantum jumps, which we'll talk about in a moment, but basically I'm not talking about the physics at the moment. I'm just saying there is some measurement I could have done on the environment for which these are the Krauss operators. There is always some measurement on the environment for which these are the Krauss operators. And if I did that measurement on the environment and I found outcome one, then quantum Bayes rule says apply the appropriate Krauss operator and then renormalize. And that Krauss operator is given by this, and the way I do that thus is equivalent to applying the jump operator to the state and renormalizing. And I should do that with this probability. Otherwise, I apply the no jump evolution, which is corresponds to the zero outcome of the measurement, and that Krauss operator is equivalent to this non-unitary evolution, and I renormalize the state, and that happens with the remaining probability. So from a numerical perspective, I could um, do this, right, in exactly the same way that I just described. I would calculate, say, the probability for a jump by calculating the expectation value of L dagger L with my state in the little time interval delta t. Of course, it wouldn't be a dt. It would be a delta t on my computer that I would use to be some small time interval. And then I would throw a dart and see whether in my computer ran between zero, uniform between zero and one, and see if it lands. And if it lands in, in the right spot, I would do a jump, otherwise what I do is I apply the no jump evolution, okay? So, okay, so that gives me, I would, you know, numerically, I would pick a small time interval delta t which is much, much smaller than any relevant dynamical time scale. Do I have a question at this point of time? Let, let me just finish this and I'll, I'll, I'll answer. Um, and so, for example, that could be for a two level atom. You know, delta t is much, much smaller than, you know, the Rabi period or the lifetime. If I'm thinking about a two-level atom that I'm driving, there might be some Rabi evolution, there might be some lifetime, and I want to make sure that I'm capturing those dynamics and so my delta t should be very small compared to that. Yes, sure. So, wait, so um, when we derive the Markovian dynamics, right? Yes. We have we are assuming that the, um, the relaxation time of the environment is really, really sure. small. Yeah. So if that is the case, then at, in, at least in the ideal limit, that relaxation time goes to uh, what, zero, which means you can never pick a delta t with a small amount. Absolutely. Amount. So this is, of course, in the usual story of coarse grain, much, much bigger than the correlation time with the environment. So we can never actually do, I mean, no evolution according to a Markov mass equation can be truly fine grained. It's always a coarse grained. But the question one can ask oneself is what are the actual timescales that might be of interest? This might be some nanoseconds, this might be some zeptoseconds, you know, it could be 10 to the minus you know, 16 seconds versus 10 to the minus nine, there could be five orders of magnitude in between, and I really don't care. That's what only, the, that's the only way this would make sense. I don't know, is that those probably not there, right? That's a big number of small numbers. Wasn't the Nobel Prize like here about brothers. <coughs> Atto seconds? I yeah, Atto correlation yeah. times. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's probably the experiments that, right? Okay, but good, all right, so, 
what, what we would do in this case, so we would pick that time, and then what we would have is, you know, I would start with psi at the initial time, and then I'd get psi at delta t, and then psi at, I would numerically integrate. And how would I do it? So I want, this is a, a method for numerically integrating the master equation, okay? So, well, I'm gonna use this method. Importantly, I, what I'm gonna do is, I want to say that my state at a given time is the statistical mixture of pure states. Such that this is the solution to the Lindblad master what we have in the Lindblad master equation is a way to get us as a CP map in every time interval. But this is, each, this is not the CP map. Each one of these guys evolves stochastically. Because what we just said is that I don't know whether the state is going to be this or that. It could be one or the other. And which one happens is random with a certain probability. So this evolution is what's known as a quantum trajectory. The evolution of the system is one in which it evolves randomly. It's sometimes known as, so it evolves according to a stochastic Schrodinger equation. We'll formalize this next week, but conceptually, what it, what we have is an algorithm for how to evolve any one of these trajectories. What we do, so the, the algorithm is, given state, at time t, which is a pure state, psi at t plus delta t is equal to L acting on that renormalized with probability dp1 and it's well we probably for a, a for a, a coarse grain or we should write it like this So and then we get this, we can do it again. We get the next interval. And what we're going to see is we get an evolution of the state that is stays pure, conditioned on a measurement record. So this stochastic 
Schroeder equation is the evolution conditioned, this is very important, on a measurement record. And we're simulating which measurement record happened using Monte Carlo, which is why it was called the Monte Carlo wave function method. Not to be, not to be confused with quantum Monte Carlo, which in many body physics means something else. Uh, that's another use of the term Monte Carlo in the sign problem and all of that. But So this is the, any one of these quantum trajectories is what the evolution of the state would be conditioned on having measured the environment. What measurement record we're gonna see is random. We don't know what measurement outcomes we're gonna find. We can calculate their probability and then we can simulate how this, we would update the state conditioned on the measurement outcomes. It's a Bayesian perspective. We have a posterior state given a certain prior. And every time we see a different measurement, we have to update the state, okay? The whether we saw a jump or not. Now, importantly, we don't have the measurement record. We're trying to simulate the master equation, which is the evolution of the system when it's talked to the environment, and we don't have access to it. But we can simulate that by just doing this over and over and over again. Every time we do it, we're going to see a different almost always, I mean, it's almost, it's incredibly unlikely that we'll see the same measurement record. It sort of depends on how complicated things are. So we're going to see many, many different quantum trajectories, each quantum trajectory corresponding to a different possible measurement record that could have happened. And when we just average over all the trajectories, that's equivalent to the solution to the deterministic master equation. The master equation is deterministic. It's a differential equation with no random terms in it. But the statistics of it are simulated through this Monte Carlo approach. In the same way that this was a completely deterministic map. You know, this is the input state, this is the output state but I could have simulated it in this brain dead way, in the end, I would get a fraction of the ones of phi down to zero and the fraction of ones of phi and one, and that would be the right fraction, independent of the particular flip of the coin. So, anyone have any questions about that? It's, a, it's something to absorb a little bit. It's a very interesting idea, I think. And there's a kind of, so let's, let's think about this from a specific case. Our friend, the two-level atom. Decaying by spontaneous emission. So let's, just to start, let's imagine we have the driven case. So I have my two-level atom, I'm, I'm driving it, there's some Rabi frequency. So this is thing is going to Rabi oscillate if it was uh, a closed system, but it also spontaneously decays, right, with some gamma, okay? Now, this is a problem we can solve actually exactly, we never did it for the, we can do it for the closed system easily. That's just precession on the block sphere. For the open system, it's more complicated. There's something called the Tory solutions, but we never actually solved it. But we kind of know what happens, right? If I, if I, for example, looked at 
you know, the probability to be in the excited state as a function of time, uh, what we know is that this thing will, you know, rob the oscillate and get to some steady state. Right, and that's the solution to the master equation, is there damp drop the oscillation. Now, in this problem, we have one jump operator, which is sigma minus, proportional sigma minus, right? Um, so, what is the probability of seeing this, of course, is the same thing as the thing that takes me from the excited state to the ground state? Okay. What is the probability of seeing a jump in a small time interval of delta t? How would you calculate it according to this? <clears throat> Gamma and then delta p? Because you just do L dagger L? We have to do L dagger L. So we look at we have to look at the expected value of L dagger L delta t. Because it's the Krauss operator. There's the, the Krauss operator and then there's the jump operator and blah blah blah. Right? So the Krauss operator is L root. Small interval, which is delta t, right? And so, what is that equal to? L dagger L is equal to gamma times the projector onto the excited state, right? And so, this is equal to, in this case, uh, the you know the probability to be in the excited state. gamma dt. Does that make sense? Sure. This is saying that in any time interval, the probability of seeing a jump is equal to, well, it's got to be in the excited state. There's some probability it's in the excited state. And if it's an excited state, the probability that it'll jump in time delta t is gamma delta t. Makes perfect sense. That's what you would just guess if you didn't know any of this rigmarole of Krauss operators and the lab or whatever. You would say this is the probability that the thing will... So a jump here corresponds to spontaneous emission. What's the probability of not having a quantum jump? One minus that. But that's actually also equal to this question, what this means. It's the square of the norm of that. The degree to which that norm has decayed tells me something about the fact that a jump didn't happen in that short time interval. All right, so what happens if a jump, if, if we throw the dark and the dark lands in, in this interval, so we would divide 0 to 1, this interval, and then the remaining is dp0, and we would throw the dark. And if it lands in here, if a jump happens, which we would do with Monte Carlo to simulate whether or not that happens, the chance of it happening would be the chance that the dark lands in the right 
interval, then what's the state after? Well, we apply the jump operator. So the state after the jump is apply the jump operator. And then we normalize. But the jump operator is sigma minus, right? And so what is this? So I would apply the square root of this. It's equivalent in this case to applying sigma minus to the thing because we renormalize. We don't care about that. But that is the ground state up to an overall phase that I don't care about. The overall phase doesn't matter because we're at the end of the day looking at the convex combination of the density matrices. So right after the jump, as expected, when we, if we see the photon, then right then, we know the state is in the ground state. Now, of course, once it's in the ground state, if it's being driven, it can go up there again, right? So a, a particular quantum trajectory of this would look like the following. So let's look at a single quantum trajectory. The quantum trajectory is conditioned on some measurement record. And I want to look, say, the probability of being excited state as a function of time. Well, what I would, might find is the following. It starts to oscillate, and then it jumps. And when it jumps, it's in the ground state. And it starts again. And maybe it just jumps there. And then it starts again. And then maybe it jumps there. And then have some stochastic set of jumps and that punctuate the evolution in between the evolution is deterministic but not unitary. Yeah. So our unit so the in the case that we don't have any jumps. Yeah. We're just oscillating back and forth. So I don't think we should have these decay envelopes. No, we do. And so because of the fact that we're not evolving according to the unitary okay. evolution, yeah. that's very important. Thank you for emphasizing this point. So in between jumps. That's very important, and thank you for bringing that up. And we're going to talk about that in, this, in the next moment. The state of the system is evolving. Let's say I have a big delta t. Let's say I have a big interval delta t here. Then this evolution of the system is deterministic but not unitary. Now, this envelope is not exactly the same as that one, but it is something that decays, and that's really crucial. We'll come back to that thing now. Then I get jumps, okay? Now, I'll get a, a different, um, a, a different trajectory. The next trajectory might look like this. I do it, maybe it just jumps right away, and then it does something, and then it jumps, and then maybe it has 
two oscillations and jumps. And I have, this is a different trajectory. And if I wanted to find the solution to the master equation, I have to average this over and over and over again. And what I would find in that case is something that looked like this. So I'm just going to first draw very lightly the exact solution. But what I would actually see in this thing when I did this average is something that looked more like this. It looks like data. In other words, there are error bars. And the error bars here depend on the number of trajectories. Because what I said here somewhere was that I had to take the limit as n went to infinity, but I don't have an infinite number of trajectories. So I, if I average these different things, I'm not going to get the exact solution. I'm only going to get the exact solution in the limit n goes to infinity. It's the same noise I would see in a real experiment. So, for example, when we saw, so those of you who went to the colloquium last week, we saw Manuel Endres' talk, and he measured Rabi oscillations, for example. Those beautiful, oh my god, uh, you know, perfect Rabi oscillations with, you know, 99.99999 fidelity. It was done with one atom. You don't see a Rabi oscillation. You either see zero or one when you measure it. It's done by averaging many, 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 many runs of the experiment. And the error bars were tiny because, you know, his graduate students never go to sleep. Uh, so, um, uh, well, he swapped them out. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so, in some sense, we can think about this numerics really more like an experiment done. I mean, this comes back to the whole question about quantum jumps and the ensemble interpretation of quantum mechanics. Sorry, Leslie Valentine. Um, uh, to the degree to which the state refers to a single copy or whether it only corresponds to the ensemble. And that was part of the debate about do quantum jumps really happen? Would we really observe it? Because we didn't have individual quantum systems to observe quantum jumps. Um, I'll just maybe mention the whole story about quantum jumps, and then I guess I'll say one more thing, and we'll, we'll stop for today. Um, so, Do the error bars also depend on the data too? They do. I mean, they do. I mean, you want that they're, diff they're, different, they're different error bars, uh -huh. right? I mean, the delta T is really about how smooth this will be, how, you know, how close you are to the exact solution to the differential equation, regardless of the fact that the differential equation itself is a coarse-grained Markovian approximation. But to degree we should take that as a mathematical object, like any numerical integration of a differential equation, you'll have an error, sure. do, but it's a different kind of error. Yeah. All right, so I just want to say one thing. Do quantum jumps happen? And this was debated. Uh, there were people who said, no, that's just, you know, figment of your imagination. There's no such thing as a real quantum jump because they couldn't actually look at it. But when we, people started to trap individual atomic ions, well, you can look. 
And there was an experiment, a famous experiment done, or a couple of them, I don't remember it was Weinerblatt or Dave Weinerblatt or both, um, uh, where they looked at the following kind of problem. So let's say I have a ground state, which is an L equals zero state, sometimes known as an S state. And I have two kinds of excited states. One that is an L equals one state, that is the orbital angular momentum, known as a P state. And that has a, an allowed electric dipole transition by the parity selection rules. Let's say this guy is a D state. That's L equals two. That's a very, yeah. What are the labels on the two excited states? Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, let's call this one E2. Thank you. Uh, and this is forbidden, but you know, you could drive it with enough. It's a, it's a quadrupole transition, electric quadrupole. So let's say the atom starts here. This is a very strong transition. So what's going to happen is absorb and emit, and absorb and emit, absorb and emit, absorb and emit. And every once in a while, it absorbs here. It kind of does a quantum jump into that state. It absorbs a photon. And then, well, then I wouldn't see much. Well, then it'll fall back into this state sometime later. And then, and if you look at the fluorescence as a function of time, you see what's called a random telegraph signal. where the fluorescence turns on and off. And the statistics of when it turns on and off is when these quantum jumps happen. And this was a, this was, this was a method originally associated with a way of cooling and shelving atoms, but it became the method of actually observing a quantum jump. And that's one of the reasons this whole quantum trajectory method was also called the quantum jump method. Okay, uh, so in a given interval, we see these jumps, the statistics of those jumps, when those jumps happen, tell me something about the dynamics. Yeah? Well, we can come up with different frac stuff, right? So you come up with different time graphs. Yeah. So we have different jumps. Yeah, we're not there yet, okay. but we'll get there. Yeah, but thank you. I, 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 I want to hold off that thought, but indeed. I do want to just mention one last thing before we, we stop for today, because I have to get ready for our, our seminar, um, which I encourage you to go to if you have time, um, is, you know, how we should conceptually think about this quantum trajectory method. What we should think about is there's a, a sense in which a quantum trajectory is Schrodinger evolution plus continuous measurement or continuous observation. So the point is the following. Let's say I have my two-level atom. Again, I'm driving it, and it can spontaneously emit. So there's a laser beam that I'm shining on my atom and driving this dynamics and spontaneous emitting. I can imagine that I surround my atom with four pi steradian of detectors. So this is the biggest of big brothers that exists <laughs> for the universe, where I'm, you know, I'll be watching you, as the police said. Um, and there's a chance that one of these detectors will go click. If that detector goes click, then I know at that instant 
relative to the retarded time. The atoms in the ground state. And then I would be able to predict when the next time I'm going to see a click is. Because if I saw one there, then I know at that moment, relative to the retarded time, the atoms in the ground state. And so what the quantum trajectory does is it allows me to update my prediction of when I'm going to see the next click, having already either not seen a click or seen a click. Okay? But what we see is important, not seeing a click in a, in a certain time interval. is information two. It's going to be critical. It comes back really to your question. The reason that the evolution in between jumps is not just the unitary Schrodinger equation, is that the fact that I didn't see a click is information about the state that I wouldn't have had had I not looked. So not seeing a click is also information, and it means I have to update my state in some way conditioned on that. In particular, what I should see, if I didn't see it in the exciting, if I didn't see a photon in that time interval, then the chances were it wasn't in the excited state. Because if it were in the excited state, there's more chance. And so I should take away probability amplitude proportionally and that is the effective Hamiltonian part. L dagger L, sitting here somewhere, the imaginary part of the Hamiltonian is related to the probability of the excited state. And the, the lack of clicks means over that time interval, take away chance. And that's why this thing is decaying in that way. And we're going to see next lecture how critical that is and how sometimes counterintuitive information that the the, the 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 update on the system that we do conditioned on no jump is not just unitary evolution but decaying evolution even when we don't see a jump all right i think we'll leave it there i've got to get my act